Well, um, good afternoon again. <laughs> You've heard it before, but you haven't. Um, hello, everybody on the internet and, uh, and in satellite seminar. I know we've got people watching in Truro uh, and Taunton, and I know that we've also got people watching on the web uh, in various places, including, I think, Spain. Um, so thanks very much indeed for all coming. Uh, our first speaker will go on straight to Bob Gann. Bob Gann is Director of New Media at NHS Direct, and he'll be telling us about both his job and the developments in NHS Direct. So, Bob. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, a particular thank you to those people who were so strongly persuaded to stay. I hope, <laughs> I hope not too much against your will, and I, I, I very sincerely hope you find it interesting, uh, considering the lack of choice you had in, in, in staying. <laughs> so thank you ever so much for that. Um, I, I have the, the, the great privilege of um, being a, a visiting professor here at, at Plymouth and I often feel I do very little to justify and repay that, that honour. So I'm delighted to be able to be with you today and, and to make just a very small um, payback uh, for that. I've heard in the sessions that I've attended here at the conference um, three big themes that have come through in the, in the things that I've, I've been at. There's been a big theme about technology and not least the opportunity for people on the internet to um, join this presentation. So good afternoon to anyone who is listening to it um, and seeing it on, on the internet. So that, that's been a major theme. There's then been another theme about choice, particularly about choice in public services. And I've heard more than one speaker really question the value of choice and whether that does make people happier, does lead to better and more effective local services. And I was reminded of the burden of choice when last night um, Ray and, and, and some of the other speakers went out for a very nice meal at the Wet Wok, which I'm sure some of you know. And as is the nature of Chinese restaurants, I was faced with 160 menu options. And that for me is a burden of choice. That is too much choice for me. And I was more than happy to follow the kind of communitarian option of settling for the set menu and sharing that with the people around the table. And I thought that was a, quite a nice example of where choice may actually be more than we always want to have. So there's a theme around technology, a theme around choice. And I've also been to several sessions which have had a very strong theme around social inclusion and what we can do to make public services more accessible, more usable to all sections of society. And I want to particularly focus on, on that in my presentation and to tell you a bit about how we've in NHS Direct developed a, a, a service that uses a wide range of different public access technologies to try and reach as wide a, a, a section of society as possible. So what I'm going to do in the presentation is I'll, I'll talk a little bit initially about the policy context for this work, what, what the government's saying, what the Department of Health's saying about bringing those sorts of services to the public. I'll tell you a bit about the kinds of services that we're offering in NHS Direct and the sorts of channels or public technologies that we're using to reach people. I want to say a little bit about the trends in public access technology and, and the take-up of technologies by people in society and, and how that's giving us some steers about which are the important technologies to get engaged in and then particularly to focus on um, digital television. Now th this for us has been the biggest recent development. It's been the biggest part of my work for the past year. Um, we launched a service on Sky in December and I'll tell you uh, more about that service because I think that has huge potential for reaching um, sections of society that perhaps we don't reach very well at the moment. And I'll finally just say a bit about some of the distinctive features of digital TV as a public information medium and why it's not just the web on television. It's something really rather more than that. 
um, and I hope you'll find that interesting. So NHS policy. Um, five years ago now almost we had uh, a 10 year plan for the NHS launched called the NHS plan and this set out a vision for how we would develop NHS healthcare services over the period to 2010 and there was a, a, a significant sentence in the NHS plan that said patients will be helped to navigate the maze of health information through the development of various NHS direct services and just to unpack that sentence I think that says several quite important things firstly it says that information and actually accessing health services generally can be a maze it can be very confusing for patients and the public to know what information to trust what uh, information supports the decisions they need to make in healthcare, how to find out about services available to them. So it can be a maze. Secondly, I think there's an important statement that says patients will be helped. And I think that's actually quite key. I mean, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but actually in many countries there's an acceptance that using information is just like a consumer decision. There's a marketplace for health information. People have masses of choices of resources to use. And is it anything to do with government or anything to do with um, public services to help people to do that? We don't think that in the NHS. We think that part of what we do for patients should be to help patients to find the best quality information. Now, clearly, there is a very key role for the individual healthcare practitioner, the healthcare professional, be they a doctor, a nurse, a midwife, a pharmacist, to advise patients. But for most of patients' lives, particularly perhaps, let's say, patients coping with long-term chronic conditions, most of the time they are looking after themselves. Most of the time they will be looking for information, if you like, on a freelance basis. So we need to accept that patients will go straight to the internet or will go straight to television or the media. And we need to do some work to help them to go to the right information, the best information. And then the third important thing that this sentence is saying for me is we need to use a range of technologies we need to recognize that some people will like to use the internet. Some people will use TV, call centers, etc. And that's very much what we've tried to do in NHS Direct, to give people a choice in the technologies that uh, are meaningful to them. So I'll go on and just paint a picture of the technologies that we're using in NHS Direct and, and, and the distinctive features of those. Now imagine for most people, NHS Direct, if they've heard of it at all, and, and we do monthly tracking research, and we know that the majority of the population do now know what NHS Direct is. They have heard of it, and very significant um, numbers of, of population have actually used the service. Probably most people have heard of, and if they've used the service, are likely to have accessed the NHS Direct Telephone Service. Now, I'm sure some of you know this already, but um, for those who don't, and perhaps particularly anybody um, from other countries who's either here in the room or, or accessing the, the, the presentation remotely, NHS Direct is a 24-hour, every hour of the day, every day of the year service um, for patients and the public. It provides access to uh, both nurse advice on current symptoms and information about health services and how to use them and, and, and how to help yourself. Um, run currently from uh, about 22 telephone call centres, employing about, uh, I think, almost 2,000 nurses and a number of other staff who do things like do the initial call handling, provide support services including information technology, library support, 
um, information and obviously all the management structures that you need in an organization of that size. NHS Direct last year did about 6 million telephone calls and we're looking at that going up to about 16 million telephone calls by next year. So use is growing very rapidly. Um, that's just a, a picture there of one of our call centers. And what you can just about see there is um, a, a, a computer screen with um, the decision support software that NHS Direct uses. So although we employ um, highly skilled, experienced nurses, um, they're not just giving advice um, from their own um, clinical experience and their own knowledge. They are using um, a decision support software that prompts questions to ask of the caller, um, suggests a response and gives a rationale and an evidence base for that response and crucially creates a health record. Um, and it's very important obviously that we record and track um, inquiries that have come into NHS Direct and in due course that record will become part of the full electronic health record <coughs> and also in due course nurses answering calls on NHS Direct will be able to access the patient's health record um, uh, as part of um, the NHS. Um, that is several years off I think but obviously will be a significant development. NHS Direct Online, this is our um, website. We launched this um, about just over five years ago now, in 1999, and we are almost up to a million individual visits a month on the website. Last month, and February is a short month, remember, we had 950,000 individual visits. That's one of the heaviest used health websites in the world. Um, and certainly the most heavily used in, in the UK. NHS Direct Online includes a, a health encyclopedia, a lot of information about local services. It's got a, a kind of popular, simplified version of the decision support software used in the call centres. So a caller can go, or a, a visitor to the website can go through on the screen uh, a, a clinical algorithm with a set of questions and answers about their symptom and come up with an answer at the end, a bit like if they'd phoned NHS Direct. Website also has emerging health topics, so things like health alerts, health scares. Um, we've had a lot of information about Sudan food dye, you can imagine, recently, and, and other kind of emerging health issues. We've also got um, some touchscreen kiosks in public environments. I think that. Yes, the, um, uh, unfortunately both the kiosk and the model seem to have been rather unfortunately widened in that picture. She, she was much narrower than that last time I saw her. Um, and I think that's just the, the, the way that piece of the PowerPoint slide has been put together. It's ni neither the model nor the kiosk is that wide. Um, and these are really designed for people who don't have access to the internet in their homes, presents simplified information for... Uh, the public in places like railway stations, shopping centres, uh, motorway services, um, got one in a prison, uh, th those kinds of public settings, sports centres, education environments. Um, we're actually reviewing the continuing requirement for those. We, we've had some pieces of evaluation done, including some work that Ray Jones has been involved in, um, which demonstrates some real value for touchscreen kiosks in terms of bringing information to people um, in those kinds of environments, perhaps if they don't have access to technologies in their home. Um, however, two, two or three things. I think obviously there's, a, there's an issue about confidentiality. People are not very likely to use um, uh, you know, very sensitive information about a current health issue in that kind of public environment. They're also quite an expensive technology. Maintaining those kiosks is quite an expensive thing to do compared with running a website, for example. And I also have a slight concern that they, they are kind of information silos in a way, as though you can only view on those kiosks information from NHS Direct. Um, and when I look around me, I see a lot of other high street kiosks that have information about 
local services, railway times, those, those kinds of things. And, I, and we're just developing a strategy, but I think our approach will be to move <coughs> from having our own dedicated kiosks to providing NHS direct information onto other community-based kiosks. So instead of being box providers, we'll be content providers. Um, and that, that's the likely strategy. And then finally, um, we uh, have developed a print version of those um, self-help algorithms on the website. Um, used to be able to buy that in pharmacists for $1.99 and GPs and health visitors used to give them out to patients. But what we really wanted to do was to deliver those to every home in the country. But we didn't have the resource to do that. So I'm very pleased that last year we did a deal with Thompson's directories. And as you know, Thompson's provide directories of telephone numbers and services that are delivered free to households. Um, and Thompson's have now started including the self-help guide, which has got um, self-care algorithms for about 30 common symptoms in the back of the Thompson's directories. And that has got us the self-help guide delivered to 20 million homes in the country. And we've almost completed the full cycle of delivery. I live in um, Salisbury in Wiltshire, and I must be the last home in the country not to have a Thompson's directory. Um, and I'm waiting with keen anticipation for the Thompson's directory to arrive on my doormat. I'm probably the only person in the country waiting with keen anticipation for a Thompson's <laughs> directory to arrive. But for me, this is a really, really important initiative. And I actually think that however much we um, have focused on technologies, that for many people a simple, accessible print resource like that could actually be a really helpful thing in, in their homes. I mentioned something about technology trends. Um, I've, uh, this, this is a slide um, from a regular quarterly tracker that Maury, the, the polling organization, do about take up of um, public technologies. And what you can see on that is uh, take up uh, the top line, the red top line is take up of mobile phones. 82% of homes in the country have uh, a mobile phone. Um, I've got three teenage sons, or one's just over teenage, but that kind of age. We have about eight mobile phones in my home, um, and I'm sure many other people are like that. Apparently there are more mobile phones than people in Britain now. Um, but what that slide also shows is that um, home access to the internet is about 56% of homes. And interestingly, home access to digital TV is now 56% of homes. And there is, that's the December Maury tracker. I actually, after I'd sent these slides to Ray, I logged on to the Maury website and they had the March tracker. And that's shown for the first time that more homes now have digital television than have access to the internet. So digital TV is now a bigger home access technology than the internet. It's about 58% of homes. <coughs> but what's very interesting, I think, is the social mix of that public access. And as you can see on this, this slide here, um, the, the big green boxes are mobile phones, which are very ubiquitous and have a very wide take up. The, the light green box shows take up in the home of the internet. And as you can see, there's a big difference between um, a, B, um, well-off homes that have, you know, very good home access to the net and at the other end, D, E homes where only 30% have home access to the net. What you can see with the red box, though, is that take-up of digital TV is a lot more socially equitable and actually take-up of digital TV is highest in the C2 social class. And we think there's some real potential around that for bringing health information and advice to, to the sorts of people who wouldn't necessarily use our website, for example. There is a slight difference if you look at the dif different digital TV platforms as well, which is also quite interesting, I think. If you look at Sky, and Sky's the largest provider, satellite television, about a third of all homes in Britain have Sky. But um, the, the profile of Sky users is quite young. 
So if we want to reach young people, particularly young men, that's a good technology. Young men have Sky for the football, essentially. So that's a, that's a good user group. Um, and also 55% of Sky users are in the C2DE social class. If you look at the other platforms, Freeview, which is, as you probably know, where you just buy a set-top box, rather um, older profile. Freeview users tend to be rather older, and they also tend to be quite middle class. And cable viewers are very like the rest of the population. I'm actually a cable user at home. I haven't got Sky Digital satellite at home. Um, I'm just a cable viewer, so I'm like the rest of the population. So there on the, uh, on the right of the screen is me and my lovely family looking at um, cable television. So in December, we launched NHS Direct Interactive. And NHS Direct Interactive is um, a, uh, a new service on, initially launched on Sky, which is the biggest <laughs> dedicated public service on digital television. And you can find that on Sky if you go into the interactive button on Sky, you scroll down through about 10 gambling channels, and then you get to NHS Direct. Um, it's predominantly a text-based service, so you can choose text from a menu, and there's about 3,000 pages of information uh, on over 500 topics, supported by images and, and video, and we've just been shooting another whole load of new videos to go on the service. And those are just a couple of screenshots which show you um, the kind of level of detail that you can get on a screen. And I think people used to kind of web-based services will see that that's actually quite brief and quite succinct. And in many ways, that's a very good thing to have to make information very simple and succinct. We've been very keen to grasp the opportunities of digital TV um, to make the service as simple and accessible as possible. So we've had a, an approach where we've used a whole load of sources of advice and guidance on the accessibility and usability of the service. We've worked with um, patient organisations and charities, particularly Royal National Institute for the Blind, Royal National Institute for the Deaf, Help the Aged. We've going round that wheel, we've worked with the viewing public. We've had focus groups of members of the public looking at prototypes of the service. We had some pilots of the service um, a couple of years ago, and those were evaluated, and there's some published studies done by um, Dave Nicholas and colleagues at City University, and those are in the public domain. We've used published guidelines on how to do it properly with digital TV. And we've also worked with our service providers, the company that have designed the service for us and Sky. They know a lot about delivering digital TV. They know much more than we do, and that's been very helpful. So how are we rolling out the digital TV service? Well, it was launched on Sky, uh, 16th of December 2004, and you can get to it through a number of points in the Sky service by using the interactive button on your um, remote control by going into the Sky Active Zone. Um, we introduced a lot of local service information shortly after the launch, so you can find your nearest GP, pharmacist, whatever. Um, we will be making it available to cable and free view during 2005. And the most exciting development, I think, this year is red button linking. Now, what this is, is if you're watching a, a broadcast television program, and you see a red button in the corner of the screen. I'm sure some people know this. If you press that button, you can get further information and content to do with that program. We're having discussions currently, initially with Channel 4, about um, if there's a program on a health issue, which could actually be a health program, or it could be even a soap with a health theme. Press the red button, and you go into NHS Direct Interactive for more information. And then we're looking at doing some interactive pilots, things like quizzes, um, body mass index calculators, things like that that involve people in a more interactive way. One of the things we have learnt, and I'll, I'll draw to a close in a couple of minutes, is that digital TV is not the web on television. And there are a number of differences that, that I've tried to set out on that slide. 
if you're using the internet, it's a very lean forward medium. You're using a keyboard and a mouse, you're quite close to it, it's quite individual, quite private. If you're watching digital TV, it's a sit-back medium. It tends to be shared. You might be looking in your front room rather than tucked away somewhere where you do your internet. Um, there's a kind of focus around leisure and relaxation. Um, you're using the medium of television, so you've got the limitations of just having a, a remote control. You've got no mouse and keyboard. Um, and we think there's some different things we can do with the web and with digital TV. Increasingly, we're going to focus our information about healthy living, um, those kinds of issues, on the digital TV service, and more detailed information about um, managing a health problem, learning more about that, wanting to know really detailed stuff about the evidence behind that onto our website. So although we don't want to kind of pigeonhole people into those media, I think the media do play to different strengths. So what we now have, in addition to those services I showed you initially, is a new service, Digital TV, to complete that suite. And just my very last slide, and I'll stop to give five minutes or so for questions. NHS Direct Interactive is part of our new multi-channel service. We think it can help us reach audiences who might not use our other channels. We've learnt a lot that it's not the web on TV. It does different things, and it may lend particularly to healthy lifestyle and interactive applications. Thank you very much. Are there, are there any uh, questions for Bob uh, from the floor? Um, I haven't seen any questions coming in. Oh, there's, there's actually one question coming from uh, on the web here. Yeah. Oh, tremendous. Um, it's, uh, it says, um, it's from Greece. Yeah, wow. Um, and asking if, uh, d does the, it's about, I'm going to say a question, hang on. Um, <laughs> I think what the question means is getting at is the is there an age difference in the um, take up of different technologies uh, and how does that compare with the social class one you talked about and will older people be left out of this? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good question. There, there is a there is an age difference as much as we know because obviously things like the website you tend to know very little about the people coming to visit but we, we have done a number of surveys and information gathering exercises. There's a slightly lower age demographic on the website users um, and slightly older on the telephone service. Um, there's also uh, more women using the phone service and more men using the website. Um, but I think the point about older people is very valid. We're not really reaching older people with any of our technologies. And I think there's really, there is quite a big um, age thing about remote access to services rather than telephone access to services. We may find things like Freeview, um, which as I say is a good take up amongst older people, might help with that. But I think that really is a, a, a bridge that we need to, 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 to um, cross and, and perhaps older people are one that might get missed out a bit. I think we've got time for one more question. Mary, go on. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I, I really enjoyed uh, that presentation. But I What's resonating with me is this morning we learned that still 7% of the, 14% of the adult population haven't got a reading age of 7. Mm -hmm. And you're putting out on Sky to um, a group who I would say probably has a higher proportion than that, who cannot read. I could read what you put up, but I wondered whether there are also oral stimulations when you go into this yeah. particular site and whether there is a way of accessing it through speaking as well as typing? Um, there, is, there isn't a way of accessing it through speaking, although that's a very interesting point. The only way currently you can access NHS Direct by speaking is to phone the call centre. Um, in terms of presenting information um, orally, um, we are very much looking at more audio content, probably particularly audio content in languages other than English, where people may not be able to read their own language, um, let alone Read, read English, um, and we are developing more video, as I said. The problem with video is it's extremely bandwidth hungry, and we need to buy more bandwidth to do that. So there are some resource constraints, but, but it's certainly something we're addressing. 
I think at that point we have to stop. So thank you very much indeed, Bob. Thank you. And now I'm very pleased to welcome as our, as our next speaker and our last speaker for the afternoon. No, don't, please don't go. He's going to be really good. He's going to be re this man has flown all the way from uh, uh, Rochester in the States. It's the Mayo Clinic. And he's going to be, it's John Backman, and he's going to be talking about computer patient interviewing. And I think we can uh, just get the mouse and use the window. And we're away. It's quality, John. Good afternoon. It's so nice to be here in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that are going to be really hard. I, I do not want to offend anyone. But we're going to talk about evidence-based medicine and try to apply it. And sometimes that's very difficult. You see, we get into behaviors. And when we want to change them, it's extremely difficult. It's much easier to take someone who has no experience and train them to take someone who has experience, knows what they think they know, extinguish that behavior, and start a new behavior. As we go through my presentation, remember that. My hypothesis, the best way to obtain comprehensive historical data from a patient in an efficient, cost-effective manner is to have the patient enter information directly into a computer. Boom. If you take a look at healthcare outcomes, we will all have different positions. If you're a physician or a healthcare worker, you will be interested in the body, the person getting better. If you're the patient, you will be interested in things such as access, satisfaction. And if you are the payer, you will be interested in cost containment. If we wish to be successful in any enterprise in healthcare, we need to consider all three. This is called the Iron Triangle. Access, quality, cost. In any healthcare system, if you can deliver all three, you will have a successful system. Patient computer dialogue will improve all three. Okay, let's back off. Imagine we're in the Caribbean. It's beautiful. We've never left this island. It's absolutely gorgeous. Everywhere we go, we know what it's like. We can reach out and grab the things we need. Then what happens is we hear a roar in the night. And then the next morning, someone greets us, someone we've never seen before, and they say some very strange things. They said they flew into our island yesterday. We've never seen a plane before. And what do we say to that person? We say, you're lying. This cannot be true, because we know better. We know that on this island, in order to fly, you have to have feathers. You don't have feathers. You didn't fly. We can go over and lift up the plane and say, gee whiz, you can't fly this thing, it's too heavy. These are all true statements. And yet, we can then say, hey, that doesn't fit in with my culture. I'm leaving. I can go back to where I was and continue to do the same things over and over again, not knowing that there's a whole other world out there that there's a whole hurricane ready to come down on top of you. Or you might say, I want to look at this a little bit more closely. You'll begin to look at the stuff and it's overwhelming. Look at that dashboard. I can't possibly do it. These must be special people. They came from a different world. Or they're the type of persons that are just much too smart. I could never do this. And yet everyone knows that in this room, anyone can learn how to fly if given enough training. Then we would actually go up and fly, because that's the only way you really know. You go up and fly, and you look around, and you see how small your island really was. And you realize that by making these choices of getting out of your culture, of going out in an airplane, suddenly you've been given the entire world. Let's take a look at our island culture. Let's look at the evidence for how we do. If you go and see a patient, the physician would miss 54% of the patient's problems and 45% of their concerns. In 50% of visits, patients and doctors do not agree on the presented problem. 50% of psychological problems are missed 
in a typical encounter. It only takes a physician 23 seconds to interrupt the patient. We've looked at some studies with family physicians, and we gave them plenty of time. We had 134 physicians, nuts and bolts exam, 17 cases. They were given plenty of time, 20 minutes. 21% of the time is used all the time. And they had 14 to 16 patients during a Saturday, and they were being studied at a university. So these docs were being watched to see what they were going to do. And they were going to interview these patients. And they, they were model patients, and consequently the physicians were able to rate it, yeah, this is like my office. And they learned something very interesting. They learned that these doctors missed over 40% of the essential questions. Questions they all agree were necessary. Four out of 10 were missed. Even given the fact I'm being watched, I'm being videotaped and given plenty of time. Interesting enough, in 15 of the 17 cases, there was at least one doc who got 100% on that particular case. Another way of demonstrating, and I don't have time to do it, but I'm just going to put it up as an antidote. Typically what I do is I pull out a doctor to show how our traditional history is done. And the doctor interviews me as a patient. And I present a case. And it's a patient who has hypertension. And the patient over the last days, has, 10 days, has noticed an elevated blood pressure. She's on a medication. And she has an elevated blood pressure. I then show the audience what a doctor does in the island culture. I show a kind, compassionate, caring doctor talking to a patient with open-ended questions. What brings you here today? Tell me more about that. Do you have any idea what's going on? Can you help us? Then what they do is they go in and start asking specific questions to find out if they can elucidate what's going on with this patient's hypertension. Have you been altering the amount of salt you've been taking in your diet? Have you been taking your medicines every day? Is there anything you've noticed that you've changed? Have you stopped exercising? At the end of the interview, the doctor always says the same thing. I need to put this patient on a drug. A cheap drug. 100% put him on a diuretic. We all feel good. We all know that the patient has received outstanding care. We know that that night, if he's being audited or he or she has been audited, that when we look at the chart, we will see exemplary care. And then I turn my back and I said, this, isn't this wonderful? Except for one thing. It's a medical error. The reason being that instead of having that person interviewed first by a physician, this patient who had never touched a computer was allowed to sit down in front of the computer and ask yes and no questions. They reported things like, my blood pressure is high, it's been there for 10 years, and I drink. The audience of doctors usually says, aha, Eureka, she's been drinking every night and that's what's elevated her blood pressure. And I say, no, no, no. She drank only once every three months. We talk about hormones, and then we talk about the fact that the computer generated the fact that she had been taking Advil, ibuprofen, a drug over the counter, not typically brought up. And then we say, maybe that's the cause of our hypertension. It certainly could be. But then we say, no, she only takes her ibuprofen once every few weeks. We then find out the fact that the patient has restless legs, She's not exercising. And then the final point, that 10 days ago, she had received from England some imported licorice. And she'd been eating it every day. And it was a cause of her hypertension. Every medical student who studied blood pressure knows that imported licorice causes hypertension. I then point out that this made a huge difference in this patient care. Rather than being placed on a diuretic, the patient was taken off their imported licorice. The blood pressure returned back to normal. Interestingly enough, the interview pointed out this patient's problem with restless legs. It was treated with iron and it cured it within a week. We also talked about some things 
where the doctor actually elicited some things about the fact that the patient had been salt loading and had to go to a class on hypertension where she learned something. What we can learn from this experiment is, well, first of all, doctors from Mayo Clinic can make it maybe fool you. That would be a terrible assumption. Uh, no, actually, it is true, but the fact of the matter is, it points out the fact, though, that I use an example that I think is quite common in my practice, that I miss things and don't even know it because I didn't ask enough questions. In this case, the care quality of this patient was not found by reviewing the chart. The inputs in, are important. How can you talk about outputs without inputs? The computerized history provided more information that was critical to this case. So consequently, we should have all of our patients answer questions on computers to enhance their quality. This will improve the quality of history, improve access, it'll be quality save, cost savings. End of talk. Oh, there, partner. We're now confronted with a new idea, and what is our reaction? It's negative. Whenever we're confronted with a new idea, our limbic system comes in and starts saying things negative. I can read your minds. My patients could not do this. It's so impersonal. I do a much better history than any computer. I don't care what that doctor says. That is just too much information to deal with. I can't go reading all that. Those Yanks, why did they ever leave the mother country? Well, we've evolved a little bit further than the limbic system. And today, we'll use the cerebral cortex and look at the concerns and the possibilities and how you might overcome those initial reactions. Let's take a look at how it might work. A nurse or a patient can put a complaint into the computer. You can actually use a pick list and select the complaint that you need. You then have the patient look at this particular screen. Have you had any chills or fever in the past week? Yes, no, or I don't know. I would ask you, what percent of your patients can answer this questionnaire? In, do in groups of doctors, the answer ranges anywhere from 25% to 90%. When we think about it, we think about the patients that are absolutely the least likely able to do this. The literature, which has been done over numerous years and numerous studies, shows that in most practices, 90%. The worst reading is out of a charity hospital, an urban community, where it reaches 85%. Reflect on it. Do, do, do patients use ATM machines? And think about it. If you have an interpreter, wouldn't it be nice, instead of having this conversation where the, you say, do you have chest pain? And the interpreter goes, da-da-da-da. And the patient goes, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
or clinician could make much out of it. What you want is something like that. Structured information put to me in the same form as I'm used to seeing it. I can review this, read the blue parts, which are positive, and rapidly decide what's going on with the patient. Any clinician who reads this would say, gee, you got an aching back. You better put some ice on it and take some medicine. Well, some people will say patients will not like it. No, this is a very efficient system. In almost all the studies, patient satisfaction is over 95%. 10% will dislike it in some studies. Interestingly enough, 10% will like it better than the doctor. Why? It's more thorough. It's impersonal. Of course it's impersonal. It's a machine. There are some advantages, though, to being impersonal. You know? Um, one of the things is socially sensitive information. We have an interesting culture. Every psychologist I say, I can, that I've met here in the UK, I've asked this question. Which is better at picking up things that are hard to talk about, such as sexuality, um, drug use? They keep telling me that a person is better. The literature is quite contrary. If you use a computer, you will find more abuse. You will find more chemical dependency. You will find more troubles with depression. Prior to using the system, I did sports physicals. Okay? I did sports physicals. It was kind of a routine kind of thing. Then I implemented this. In the first season alone, I found two adolescents who were being abused. Why? They were using a computer. They were allowed to enter their information without seeing me, having them being turned off, perhaps by an older male. And I was able to deal with those issues. If you don't ask the questions, you don't get the proper information. This will replace me. Well, no, it won't. There's no doctor in the world that would be replaced by something that is just measured by a machine. The reason is that... I add another touch. I check out the computer. I make sure it's doing the right things. One asks the question, is it more, what's more important to agriculture, a tractor or a farmer? What's more important to medicine, the clinician or a computer? There's no doubt about it. They're just tools. I use the tool to get better. I use the tool so I can provide better quality. This is an aid. Your histories will be more accurate. You can zero in on things that are better. It picks up 40% more information. Remember that figure? What kind of stuff do we miss? 40% of essential questions. How does this help us? It picks up 40% of things that I had not thought about. I came to the United Kingdom in an airplane. What happens if that pilot said to the co-pilot before I came, gee, you know that checklist I have? You know about how I fly this airplane and, and, and take off? It has 10 items on it. I'm not going to use it today. I, I remember it. I'm going to do everything by memory today. I would not get on that airplane. What's, what's more dangerous? Going on an airplane or going into a doctor's office? How dangerous is health care? We talk about safety. All right, let's put it out. Scheduled airlines. You can see it. Ultra safe. Regulated. Things like driving. Chartered flights. Dangerous. Mountain climbing. Bungee jumping. Where is health care fit? Think about it. Why? There's a lot of reasons, but one of them is we don't get a proper history with all our data. It's highly adaptable. SARS hits the United Kingdom. Within a few minutes, questionnaires can be changed, four questions added, and every patient gets screened for SARS. Try to do that with a questionnaire. Try to do that by having people remember it. You can also personalize it. You can make it so that it asks more questions or less questions. You can make it so that it can be specialty specific or not. You can make it so that you have a woman's abuse score given at every visit or a prevention guideline given at every visit. You choose what you want to know. If you, there are some products that have different languages. We talked about people not being able to read. It can talk to you. You can respond with voice. Who controls your doctor's interview? Think about the last time you saw, saw the doctor. Who was controlling the time? Was it the doctor or the patient? Well, the doctor was. 
Who controls the computer, the doctor or the patient? Or the patient controls the computer. See how it works? It doesn't matter if you're sitting there continuing answering questions. All it does is say, okay, here's the next one. Here's the next one. The doctor at the end has an organized system that he can deal with. And interesting enough, that doctor need only deal with the positives. We know from studies that if a person says, I don't have gallstones, guess what? They don't have gallstones. But if they say that they have something, we need to check that out. It's great for research and structured data. What happens is that you can look at your inputs and see if your outputs make sense. Multimedia being used, high patient acceptance, and it has wonderful scales. Here's an example. This is a patient who says, I have restless sleep. A few corners down at the very bottom, you can see the Epworth sleepiness scale. That scale comes in and tells me, this is just like me in England. I get a little revved up and I can't sleep well. They have lots of scales. You, those of you involved in sociology and psychology would love some of the information they have. The patient can provide you scales which we know improve outcomes all on one place. You don't have to go digging through a briefcase trying to find the right scale. You just click on it and there it is. This is what the typical situation is when you see a clinician in the United Kingdom. That's the information you get. By having the patient sit down for 10 to 20 minutes prior to their visit, you can walk in with this. I can review this extremely fast because I only look at the bold. This patient's coughing sometimes. They have some sputum. It's been going on for two weeks. It's at night. They have a housemate that does it. My gosh, this is the crud. I've seen eight cases like this today. But, oh, the patient's smoking a little bit. Um, they have a sore throat. They used to have a fever. They have the muscle aches. They have a headache. Yes, this is definitely the crud, but oh my goodness, this patient at this very moment is saying to me in this computer thing, this computer output, I want to quit smoking. I can spend one minute about the crud. I can spend a lot of time then saying, I see you're ready to quit smoking. Let's talk about that. And that's the thing that provides high quality to an interview. When we think about our interactions with clinicians, is it when they ask us, do you have gallstones that we interact? Or is it when your doctor looks at you and he or she says, you know, we've got an issue here. Let's work on this together. What are the things that we can do to help you so you can? That's when you bond. That's when you need the personal touch. How would I get started if I were in the UK today? I could go over a list of all the vendors. They are in an article that I will provide for you, but there actually is only one that is currently available that I think meets the standards of having enough questions. And that is uh, IMH, which has at least 50,000 questions, has some literature supporting the software. We have in this the United Kingdom, whether it's integrated with the electronic medical record, it's inexpensive, specialty specific, and able to generate patient-friendly information. There is only one product. I have no association with products. There's one product. It's called Instant Medical History. It's offered by Prime Time Practice. If you think you can make this yourself, just remember, it has 80,000 questions. In the States, this is becoming such an interesting issue because we don't want our doctors spending time fooling around on computers. We want our patients to enter the information that goes directly in the computer, and it's no one of the reasons I can recommend it is it's integrated into 42 U.S. electronic medical records and our virtual portals where, portals where patients are interacting with physicians electronically. It's also inexpensive. If you'd like further resources, and I hope that you do, because I'm hoping that this challenges you to, ch to look at your beliefs, please check out my article on the Mayo Clinic Proceedings where I provide the evidence that supports the things I've said. You might also go to medicalhistory.com and look at some of their sample outputs. This is a process. The only people that are going to do this are early adopters. That's about 15% of the population. Follow me around anytime you wish. All of you are invited to Rochester to see me. Then start looking for lectures. In summary, the best way to obtain comprehensive historical data from a patient in an efficient, cost-effective manner 
is to have a patient enter information directly into a computer. It will improve your quality of care for patients and will help you to be a better clinician. We have the evidence. Now it's your job to break through your own personal barriers. Thank you. John, do you have any questions from, from the floor? Well, I'll have a quick look to see if anybody's got any questions in on the internet. Nothing on the internet yet. Uh, Mary McClary there. Thank you. Hello, John. Thank you for that. That was very interesting. And I wonder whether you could tell me, has it been validated in the UK or in any other country apart from the US? I am so happy that you asked that question. The question was, has it been validated in the UK? Isn't it interesting that we forget our heritages? I found out that in 1968, at Mayo Clinic, we were at the cutting edge of this and everyone had forgotten the literature. In the UK, at least 35% of my articles, a third, come from the UK. You can go back and find pioneers who have been working at this here in this country and have contributed to the literature. The last review of this very topic and these concepts was done First by me, but then if you go to the next one, it was the British Medical Journal. You can go to the British Medical Journal and you can find an article that has all these basic concepts available. The principles of flight were discovered a long time ago. They're still out there. Go to the old literature. I believe it was like, an, you'll find the reference in my uh, uh, article. But the BMJ had a, a two and a half page review article on all the things I've chatted about. Can I be allowed a supplementary question? Okay. Thank you. Um, is it validated for use by clinicians, as at the term we would consider clinicians, i.e. all health professionals? I think your references seem to me to be about the doctor. And we as allied health professionals, the extended role and so on. Yes. They have been used by nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, psychologists. The literature goes on and on. I have, I believe, 300 references in my article. I have also, to get those 300, those are the best 300 out of 3,000. And I think we probably have to wind up there, do we? Yes, we do. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, John. Thank you very much, audience. And thank you, uh, those people who are watching on the internet uh, on Saturday. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. particular thank you to those people who were so strongly persuaded to stay. I hope, <laughs> I hope not too much against your will and I, I, I very sincerely hope you find it interesting uh, considering the lack of choice you had in, in, in staying. <laughs> so thank you ever so much for that. Um, I, I have the, the, the great privilege of um, being a, a visiting professor here at, at Plymouth and I often feel I do very little to justify and repay that, that honour. So I'm delighted to be able to be with you today and, and to make just a very small um, payback uh, for that. I've heard in the sessions that I've attended here at the conference um, three big themes that have come through in the, in the things that I've, I've been at. There's been a big theme about technology and not least the opportunity for people on the internet to um, join this presentation. So good afternoon to anyone who is listening to it. Um, and
Good afternoon again. <laughs> You've heard it before, but you haven't. Um, hello, everybody on the internet and, uh, and in satellite seminar. I know we've got people watching in Truro uh, and Taunton, and I know that we've also got people watching on the web uh, in various places, including, I think, Spain. Um, so thanks very much indeed for all coming. Uh, our first speaker will go on straight to Bob Gann. Bob Gann is Director of New Media at NHS Direct, and he'll be telling us about both his job and the developments in NHS Direct. So, Bob. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, thank you for inviting me. I've been to several sessions which have had a very strong theme around social inclusion and what we can do to make public services more accessible, more usable to all sections of society. And I want to particularly focus on, on that in my presentation and to tell you a bit about how we've in NHS Direct developed a, a, a service that uses a wide range of different public access technologies to try and reach as wide a, a, a section of society as possible. So what I'm going to do in the presentation is I'll, I'll talk a little bit initially about the policy context for this work, what, what the government's saying, what the Department of Health's saying about bringing those sorts of services to the public. I'll tell you a bit about the kinds of services that we're offering in NHS Direct and the sorts of channels or public technologies that we're using to reach people. I want to say a little bit about the doing it on, on the internet. So that, that's been a major theme. There's then been another theme about choice, particularly about choice in public services. And I've heard more than one speaker really question the value of choice and whether that does make people happier, does lead to better and more effective local services. And I was reminded of the burden of choice when last night um, Ray and, and, and some of the other speakers went out for a very nice meal at the Wet Wok, which I'm sure some of you know. And as is the nature of Chinese restaurants, I was faced with 160 menu options. And that for me is a burden of choice. That is too much choice for me. And I was more than happy to follow the kind of communitarian option of settling for the set menu and sharing that with the people around the table. And I thought that was a, quite a nice example of where choice may actually be more than we always want to have. So there's a theme around technology, a theme around choice. And I've also trends in public access technology and, and the take-up of technologies by people in society and, and how that's giving us some steers about which are the important technologies to get engaged in. And then particularly to focus on um, digital television. Now th this for us has been the biggest recent development. It's been the biggest part of my work for the past year. Um, we launched a service on Sky in December and I'll tell you uh, more about that service because I think that has huge potential for reaching um, sections of society that perhaps we don't reach very well at the moment. And I'll finally just say a bit about some of the distinctive features of digital TV as a public information medium and why it's not just the web on television, it's something really rather more than that. Um, and I hope you'll find that interesting. So, NHS policy. Um, five years ago now, almost, we had uh, a 10-year plan for the NHS 